God can use our example of work to help bring people to Christ, bring people to salvation and the reality of the gospel. We can go through hundreds of fun stories of people who through their work made a difference and accomplished things, but it ultimately comes back to recognizing that God is the one who's given us these bodies. God, God has made us to be productive, to made us to make a difference. And as you mentioned, unfortunately, there's a lot of people who have chosen just to let somebody else take care of them instead of using their God-given gifts, talents, and abilities. On June 28, 1894, President Grover Cleveland signed Labor Day into law. Now, Labor Day is filled with back-to-school sales, picnics, swimming, and the only labor today might be mowing the lawn or manning the barbecue. That is not to say there aren't real labor problems. Nearly 11 million people who could be working have stopped in this country. In addition, the unemployment rate is still very high, but the sweatshops day, sweatshop days, I should say, are a thing of the past, and there are places where workers can now go to address real problems. We have a special guest for this special day, the president of Wall Builders, Timothy Barton, a pro-family organization that helps keep our focus on America's great history, our heroes, and our constitutional, moral, and religious history. Welcome to Centerpoint, Timothy. Thanks so much for having me. Good to be with you today. Great to have you here, and I can't wait to dive into some of the artifacts that you've, you've brought along with you. But let's start with the origins of Labor Day. Mm -hmm. Generally, the 19th century is thought of. We saw that uh, President Cleveland uh, signed Labor Day into law in the late uh, 1800s. Uh, and, and there was real hardship in the factories. The Industrial Revolution had commenced. People were being over, overworked in many cases. We've all read, or many of us have read, uh, Upton Sinclair's novel of the meatpacking industry in mm -hmm. Chicago. I have a great uh, uh, relative of mine, my great-grandfather, helped to end child labor in this country by, by uh, moving from North Carolina, where he had witnessed the horrible conditions in the cotton mills, came to Washington and helped lobby for the legislation which ended child labor in this country. But uh, sometimes the labor movement goes too far in this country. We've seen many, many instances of that. and, and uh, so there's a balance to be struck there. There's, there's no doubt about it. You're right. In the late 1800s, there was a lot of issues as you're seeing growing industry. And one of the things we know biblically about human nature is that the heart of man often tends toward evil. Without a regenerated heart through Christ, you're going to have people doing things they should not be doing. And this is something we can see literally in every industry, every era of the world, but absolutely was happening in a lot of the Industrial Revolution era as people are working to make their dollars. And so you had a lot of abuse and oppression toward uh, those in charge. Now, with it being said, it's worth noting that the guy who's credited with founding Labor Day was Peter J. McGuire, and he was a socialist, had, had strong connections to socialism. And it's, it's interesting, in that era in world history, maybe arguably more specifically America, America and the world had not really experienced socialism or what the outcome might be from socialism. This was still, at this point, Karl Marx, who was born in 1818, was promoting some Marxist ideology that was very attractive, especially if you were seeing people commit ungodly things, treat people in ungodly manners where there wasn't the respect for the individual and, and private property and, and their work and their ability. And so this idea of socialism sounded so appealing and attractive, which there's always the counterbalance of Doing things God's ways are always effective, but socialism takes some good sounding ideas and, and a good sounding heart and often goes a different direction. For Karl Marx, who wrote about what it was like to be oppressed. Now, Karl Marx, a guy who didn't have a job, who married into wealth, right? Who's having somebody pay for him to do all of his philosophical, political writing. Interestingly enough, in 1818, Frederick Douglass was also born. Frederick Douglass, born into slavery, all kinds of miserable, horrible conditions in slavery, he ends up in 1838, he escapes slavery, and uh, so many fascinating things about his journey. But it's interesting that Frederick Douglass, a, a guy who actually literally experienced oppression, was able in America, once he escaped slavery, and, and then at the end of the Civil War, where you have the 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment, you have Reconstruction. Once we change the laws of America, you have a guy who becomes significant, actually serves in four different presidential administrations after Abraham Lincoln, a guy who went from nothing and actually in, in terrible conditions to achieve great things in America, as opposed to a guy like Karl Marx, who never experienced oppression writing about this. And this was kind of the idea from a lot of socialist ideology mm. was they, 
they weren't always people that experienced oppression, but it was leaders who knew how to take people who had experienced abuse and use them for their own ends. You know, a little, little known thing about uh, uh, Karl Marx uh, and, and the author of, of the new book, The War on the West, Murray is his last name, I can't think of his first name, has written about it. He was a terrible racist, he Karl was. Marx was. <laughs> Anyway, people don't know that about No, him. and it's one thing, too, that even as we look at, at kind of the evolution story today, so, so Karl Marx, Charles Darwin, very much running in the same veins in some areas, and Charles Darwin was also an incredible racist, where Charles Darwin's book, Origin of Species, it wasn't just Origin of Species, but it was the means of preservation of the favored races. Mm -hmm. uh, a few years after Origin of Species, he wrote a book called The Descent of Man, where he gets more into racism, and, and, and to, to your point, a lot of the ideas from these political philosophers of the time that were being embraced by good meaning and often downtrodden people, they didn't even understand the ideas they were embracing. And of course, if you look at the 20th century, no ideology has been more destructive in civilization, the history of the world, than socialism, communism, and Marxism. Now, with that being said, this is not to necessarily put a totally negative spin on Labor Day because we know the Bible tells us in Proverbs 14, that in all hard work, in all labor, there is profit. Yeah. And, and God made us to work hard and be productive. And, and, and actually, I, I had a chance to bring several artifacts with me. One of the things I think is so fun about America is we were the experiment on so many levels for a lot of different ideas, including what used to be known as the American work ethic. Yes. That you could start from nothing in America and because of our system of government, be, because of the Constitution, the recognition from the founding fathers and the declaration, there are God-given rights. No matter where you started from, you could achieve and do incredible things in America if you had opportunity and a work right. ethic. On a contemporary phenomenon, mm -hmm. which is happening, that's, that's a key to the Labor Day and labor movement. It's new in this country. We're seeing mm -hmm. this, this evolution of a huge segment of the population, mm -hmm. which is not post-COVID, returning to work. Right. We've got all these available jobs and people don't want them. What's going on and what's the lesson? Yeah, well, it's certainly dangerous when we are incentivizing people to not be productive. We, we know that God made us to be productive. That's the reason God gave us gifts and talents and abilities so that we could use them for his glory. And certainly as we read the Bible, whether it's, it's Colossians 3.17 or 3.23, it talks about whatever we do, uh, we, we do it for the Lord, not for man. We do it with all our heart, knowing that it's from Christ we receive our reward. But, but what's so fun for me about setting history is I can point back to examples. Uh, this is the, the biography, it's the life of Richard Allen. Richard Allen was a black pastor, but he was a slave in the 1700s. And he was working out in the field. He heard a missionary that he was on horseback preaching the gospel. And he is so convinced he becomes a radical convert. And then in the midst of becoming a radical convert, he realizes what the Bible talked about, what were the, even the apostle Paul talked about at that time, like slaves, set an example for your master and your work ethic. He said, okay, I'm gonna work really hard. And he purposed and determined that he was gonna set an example through his work, through his life, and actually his master saw him and, and had conversations about the fact that I never have trouble with you and I never have to wonder what you're doing and why you're doing it and where you are. I mean, really remarkable thought. Well, he ends up talking to the master about Jesus. Well, the reason I do it different is because of Jesus. His master ends up becoming a Christian. He's able to get his freedom. He ends up becoming the founder of the AME denomination in America, the first black denomination okay. in America. Wow. But what's significant about this is literally, if, if we look at the biblical perspective, this is a guy who is a Christian who recognizes the role that God has for us in our life is to be productive. And even in, in our working, we set an example for Christ, for those we work with, even for our bosses and for people who are choosing not to work and be productive. It's rejecting the reality that God's given them gifts, sounds, and abilities. And it's also rejecting the notion that God's called us to be salt and light in the workplace. So if you won't even show up in the workplace, you're not being what God's called you to be, which is salt and light in the workplace, that God can use our example of work to help bring people to Christ, bring people to salvation and the reality of the gospel. We can go through hundreds of fun stories of people who through their work made a difference and accomplished things, but it ultimately comes back to recognizing that God is the one who's given us these bodies. God, God has made us to be productive, to made us to make a difference. And as you mentioned, unfortunately, there's a lot of people who have chosen just to let somebody else take care of them instead of using their God-given gifts, talents, and abilities. What a, what a great story to end on, a slave converting his master uh, through hard work and through Christianity. Uh, can't go any farther than that, any better than that. Tim Barton, what a pleasure to talk to you. Thank, thank you, you so much. Hi, I'm Doug McKelway, and thank you for watching Centerpoint. We hope you enjoyed this video. Make sure you hit the subscribe button and tap the bell icon so you're notified every time a new video is posted. Leave a comment below and keep the conversation going by sharing this video with a friend who needs to see it. Thanks for watching. We'll see you back here tomorrow.